we were around verse uh, five and six. This is where we ended uh, last time. And St. James in, the, in these couple of verses was giving us a very clear warning that the tongue is a spark. And if we're not careful, it can set on fire the whole body. And we lose a lot when that happens. We lose the ability to pray. Um, it causes division. It stirs in hatred. And we lose our inner peace and our outer peace. And St. James says that the tongue is a fire and it's, it can spread destruction all around. Um, and so to be very clear of the seriousness of the tongue. And let's move on for today. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Verses 7 and 8. And so... St. James is saying that the, the tongue is untamable. It's a very bold statement. Um, he's saying it's worse than any wild beast. Every species has been subdued by mankind, right? The beasts, the birds, which by the way, are harder to tame because they can go beyond our reach, right? The species of reptiles and sea creatures, again, harder to tame because they live in the sea the human species has been able to subdue and tame all of them. But for all this, for all his power to subdue all the nature around him, no one is able to subdue the human tongue, right? That the tongue of the human, of the mankind, it remains untamed and it's untamable. And so, you know, St. James, if you, you have to be very careful here. St. James did not say that the tongue cannot be tamed but that no man can tame the tongue. So when it is tamed, we give God credit. And this is due to his compassion and to his help. Man alone can tame, you know, wild animals, but he cannot tame the tongue. Man can discipline everything except for himself. He can discipline everything and he is, and, you know, but himself, who, like, he can't discipline himself. And so, we pray and we, we ask God to tame the tongue. And, you know, we have to remind ourselves that we cannot subdue our tongues because we're human. And so we ask God to train us, right? And we say, oh God, the Lord, the strength of my salvation. He is the strength of myself. He gives me the strength to overcome the tongue, right? Can man, who is the image of God, tame a wild lion? Sure. Well, like as if God cannot tame his image. Right, so we give strength, we give credit, we give honor to God who tames the tongue for us and gives us the strength to do this. Our hope, St. Augustine says, our hope lies in the one who tames us. So let us submit to him, seeking his mercy. Let us endure him until he tames us so that we may become perfect. Often God permits that we go through chastisement. If you use a whip to tame a wild beast, so what about God? using a whip to change us from being beasts to becoming his children. And so it's, again, only through God that we're allowed to tame our tongues. And St. James goes on to say, it, the tongue is really an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. He's saying it's full of, of, of wickedness. And, and the word translated for unruly, it, it can mean unsettled or unstable. And so the tongue is always in a state that is unsettled or unstable. It's evil, right? Always ready to break out. It's full of a, a, a death-bearing poison, able, what, to kill any relationship. And that's his point. That's the point of the danger of the tongue if we're not careful with it. In verses 9 through 12, we read, With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceeds blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring send forth fresh water from bitter and from the same opening? Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Thus no spring can yield both salt water and fresh. So what St. James is talking about here, he reminds us of how unnatural the tongue is. Right? With it, the same tongue, we bless our Lord and Father, Right, and you know, a pious Jew at this time would pray what certain benedictions every single day, and they would bless God over and again 
for his mercies, right? And we also curse men that we encounter, even though these have been made according to the likeness of God, St. James is saying. If men are made in God's image, should we not bless them even as we bless God? Right? So from the same mouth comes out both blessings and cursings. This is like a freak of nature, and it shouldn't be this way. So when we use the tongue, right, by which we bless God in prayer and cursing people who are made after God's image, then we basically insult God, right, their creator. We demean his great love, right, that he loved the whole world and he gave his only begotten son to die for them. And we demean this love by insulting our brethren. For it says, for where else in all creation could we find such a complex confusion, right? Something which is the source of two complete opposites. Does a fountain, you know, come out from a fountain from the same hole, sweet or fresh water and also bitter water? No, the fountain either is good, has good fresh water or it's bad, but it's not both, right? Consider the different trees. Is a fig tree able to make olives or is a vine able to make figs? No, each tree produces one fruit and there's always consistency, right? Consider the lakes. Is a lake, right, salt water or fresh water, right? But the salt water lake will not someday produce fresh water. It just doesn't make sense. And all of nature, in all the fountains and all trees and lakes, you see reliability. And it is the tongue and only the tongue that's unnatural one day producing blessings and the next day producing cursings. So we should have the true wisdom to know how and to when to talk, right? And that's what he gets to next. So who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. This is verse 13. So in all this, this extended you know, denunciation of the sins of the tongue, it leads us to this. Anyone among them claiming to be wise and understanding, right? And maybe this is aligned to the teachers that we were talking about from before. They must show by his good conduct, his works in meekness of wisdom. True wisdom is shown by meekness, not arrogance, right? And so we see this correlation, this um, relationship between the tongue and true wisdom. True wisdom is not revealed by the abundance of just mental knowledge. No, but it's shown by work right? Let him show by good conduct. And it's shown by meekness. St. James said, in the meekness of wisdom. So for the wise, knowledge is full of meekness, with, with humility, without any kind of pride or haughtiness. And then in verse 14 through 16, we read, but if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly and sensual and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exists, confusion and every evil thing will be there. So if they have this bitter jealousy and opportunism or self-seeking in their heart, instead of meekness, right? They should never approach the teaching office, right? If then they will not please God or further God's work. No, their work will be just like a simple showing off. Instead of teaching the truth, they will be lying against the quality of their life as they use their authority to dominate others. You know, it's very sad that one can preach and speak with such arrogance that a thoughtful listener will conclude that the preaching can't be true. And the name of God can be blasphemed among the Gentiles because of us. You know, a lot of people are not Christian because of the preaching of Christians. And if you're not careful and, you know, anyone who is really paying thoughtful attention to the words that are being preached, um, they understand that it's fake and, and people can read between the lines. This so-called wisdom that men give or they, they teach is not true wisdom. And it comes, you know, it doesn't come from above. Rather, it's false wisdom, what St. James is saying. And it's, it's earthly and demonic and sensual right? The teaching of these kind of arrogant men, it doesn't, it doesn't favor heaven, right? It doesn't, it doesn't lead people closer to God, right? Where bitter envy and self-seeking exists, wisdom becomes false. And so this jealousy makes 
one lose the truth and it leads to self-seeking, right? Um, confusion and every evil thing will be there, right? If, if we lose our inner peace. And this is when the, when this is bitter envy and self-seeking are inside the heart, then it defiles the heart. So, you know, I wanted to expand a little bit on what St. James was saying about the sources of false wisdom. He says that it's earthly and sensual and demonic. Earthly, what he's saying there is that it's stemming from the love of the world, right? Whoever has it, his heart is not elevated to heavenly matters, but earthly. So although he is zealous for the truth and his zeal and his incentive of preaching is a love of materialism and the love of honor and the love of praise of men. And it's just a rehash of secular ideas. And then he says that this wisdom, this false wisdom is sensual, right? That means it's like stemming from the love of the ego. And so one's ministry in this case is centered on the ego and does not want to appear to hide in front of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, the very famous verse that he must increase and I must decrease. No, it's I want to increase, right? The one who has the sensual sort of wisdom uh, wants to appear, right? So that one can care for the body and not for the spirit. And it, it's characterized by a life that's sense-oriented, right? S sensual and demonic, right? That's stemming from the devil and it's falling in pride and stirs pride in the people. And under the cover of wisdom, right? Being very eloquent, even, you know, even through worship and teaching others and seeking the lost souls, it's open to the influence by demons who oppose the work of God. And if these men become teachers and exercise leadership uh, motivated by this jealousy and self-seeking and ambitious desire to, become, to, to overcome, right? The result in the church will be chaos and confusion and it's just a disaster, right? How many, how many problems exist in the different churches because of this, right? It, it's a disaster of arrogance. Right? This is what arrogance does to, to a church. And St. James goes on to say, but uh, this is the last couple of verses of chapter three. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable and gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So we see the sources of true wisdom in these verses, and we see their advantages. So the sources of heavenly wisdom is from above, right? From the throne of the holy God, which God grants, right? He grants it to his children who are abiding in him. The true wisdom that is, which is from God above and comes down as his gift is very different, right? That what we just experienced. First of all, it's pure. It's straightforward, and it bestows on its owner a pure heart and a chaste life, as God is pure, and his words are pure. And therefore, whoever obtains God's wisdom can't tolerate evil, but is drawn to a pure life resembling God. It's not mixed. It's not wavering. It's not, you know, looking for various desires of self-gratification, right? And it's free from self-promotion. It's pure, right? The true teacher, the true wisdom, thinks of only of helping his people, not exalting himself, right? And it's peaceful. It's peaceable, right? It's full of peace. By wisdom, one is drawn towards God, and his heart is filled with peace, and he pours the outer peace on others, right? And he can't, even to this idea where he can't even tolerate seeing fights or, loud, or like loud talk and that kind of stuff, right? Um, it's gentle, right? When the heart is filled with peace towards others and does, you know, for the edification of others, he's gentle, right? Towards the shortcomings and the weaknesses of others. And he focuses on how to win many to Christ. And this gentleness is not this outward appearance, but it's an inner life. Whether one talks or is silent, whether someone is criticized or not, and all that, the person is gentile, gentle and compassionate but sometimes he's firm, but still compassionate and, firm and, and gentle. And they're willing to yield, right? That means they're obedient. And this is the work of, of God's wisdom to grant us a submission to him and to his word. So we may not work by our own will, but by the will of God. And it's full of mercy and good fruits. 
So where, where there's obedience, there has to be good fruits, right? And as, as false wisdom drives us to pride and then to evil work, so true wisdom is practical and it drives us to obedience and submission and mercy and good fruits, right? As faith without works is dead, so wisdom without fruits is fake. Let's say that one more time. As faith without works is dead, so wisdom without fruits is fake, right? True wisdom doesn't have partiality, right? It's not shaken or divided. It has one clear goal, and it's to clearly reveal the heavenly road. In spite of all the difficulties and hardships, you know, true wisdom makes one unable to tolerate having a divided heart between the love of God and the love of the world. It doesn't falter. It doesn't mix between two opinions. The heart is steadfast in his love and hope and direction. It also means not to favor the rich over the poor. And it's without hypocrisy, right? It does not, you know, carry what is on the outside things different than what's on the inside. And so we notice that when St. James is piling up all these additives, right, it shows that one may recognize the truly divine wisdom by the willingness not to insist on your own way. That's true wisdom, not to insist on one's own way. The wise teacher is peaceful, not looking for confrontation. It's, he's gentle, and he doesn't insist on the letter of the law. He's compliant, ready to be persuaded by someone of, in a different point of view. Right? He's full of mercy, eager to forgive like the Lord. He is unwavering, sticking to the truth with no regard to favoritism. He is not hypocritical, and he's genuine, not showing favor to the rich. And so the fruit of righteousness and maturity in the lives of the faithful is sown in peace by those who make peace. And that's the true teacher, right? That, that, man is, that, that true teacher is a man of peace, teaching in a spirit of peace, and always is willing to bend and to make peace. And if a man is overbearing and confrontational and always insists on his own way, you know, it's certain that that person does not have the wisdom that comes from above. He has that wisdom that's fake and that comes from below, right? And that was the end of chapter three, really focusing on faith and, and the tongue and the dangers of the tongue. Chapter four, uh, I hope to start and to get uh, kind of along the way in chapter four today. Um, St. James uh, continues his teachings to bring his readers to, to meekness and to peace. And now he takes on the topics of feuds and the wars and the conflicts and the fights that some of the believers are engaging in, and they stem from their earthly lusts, right? So if we look at the outline of chapter four, we see what happens when we, when we engage with these fights. We lose our inner peace. We lose our peace with God. We lose our peace with people, and it doesn't do anything for us, right? It doesn't grant us anything. And so we know chapter four is relatively a short, a short chapter, so I hope to get uh, to some, some of the the main parts of it today. And so in the first verse of chapter four, St. James says, where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasures, for pleasure that war in your members? Right, so St. James pinpoints the source of wars and fights. He says, they come from the pleasures and passions in their members and bodies. Wars and fights stem not from others annoying us, but from the weaknesses of the inner, of the inner man. It's our problem. The translation of the words used here are to show an image of the passions waging war against the bodies of his hearers and taking over more and more of their lives. You know, St. John Chrysostom said, no one can harm you unless you harm yourself. If you do not sin, there will be tens of thousands of swords which will threaten you, but God will pull you so they don't come near you, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a very comforting, sorry, it's a very comforting um, uh, verse. And it reminds us that we are the ones who harm ourselves. It, the wars are stemming from the inner man. It comes from inside. So in verse two, you lust and you do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. And so St. James denounces those who whose lives are given up to the pursuit of pleasure, right? Some of the commentaries, and this is just kind of, you can take it as you will. Some of the commentaries, as I was reviewing, 
they find a reference to murder, right? You lust and you do not have, you murder and you covet. They, they find, you know, to murder too jarring, right? It's, and they try to soften this, this word. Sometimes they suggest that St. James means simply hating enough to murder, or they change the word to translate to envy instead of to murder. Uh, that's neither here nor there, but we can still understand the context of what's happening. And so this is the effect of lusts to the one who surrenders to them. What does it benefit? St. James is addressing the Christians who are wealthy landowners, right? maybe the ones being referred to in, in chapter two, like we were talking about from before. They are not deliberately murdering people, but in their escalating, um, in their escalating desire to have more and more, some are unjust, unjustly withholding the wages of those who work their land. And so by doing that, the, the laborers who are struggling, they're dying and they're weakened and they're not eating and they're subject to disease. And so the landowners are unwittingly murdering the laborers and they're never, they're never satisfied lust to grow even richer. And it is this jealous desire for wealth that causes them to fight and to war with their neighbors, right? And given this greed and fighting, all their piety is in vain. It seems that the rich are asking for God's help in their quest for wealth, but they're needing a setback after setback. You know, there was a, in context, there was a famine that hit Palestine in the years immediately prior, and it may be relevant here, right? So if James, if St. James wrote the epistle around 48 AD, like we said from before, the effects of the famine, which has been said, that started around the year 44 AD would still be present. So the devastation of the famine would still kind of be there, right? The, the struggle. And it's possible that the rich are asking for divine relief from the effects of the famine. And so, and also the recent famine would also explain the death of the laborers, right? St. James says that the rich do not have and, re, and the requested help because they do not ask they do not ask God, right? How do I know this? Let's look at verse three. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures, right? He's saying that, the, that their prayers don't reach heaven because they ask wickedly, right? That they may spend the requested wealth on their pleasures, not on the suffering poor who labor for them. And they don't receive any help from God because their prayers are offered to, for selfish motives, right? From a heart that is in the grip of jealousy and greed, of hatred, of being judgmental. And this happens to all of us, right? We, we pray for these extravagant things in our lives, but sometimes it's to satisfy a selfish desire that's inside, right? Like, why do we need the extravagant house? Why do we need, you know, the extravagant, extravagant cars or, or things like that? Why can't we be satisfied with a car that gets us from A to B, right? But we, we ask for, you know, success in our, in our works in our, and things like that, but not necessarily to help those who are in need, but, to, but to, to obtain more, to get more. And so we have to be careful that we don't ask amiss, right? St. Gregory says, Whatever you ask from the Father in my name, he will grant you. The name of the Son is Jesus, our sa or Savior. Whoever asks in the name of the Savior is the one who asks for his salvation. So let us review our requests to see whether they are in the name of Jesus, that is, matters pertaining to our salvation. Do you request a field, a garment, material gifts, or do you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? This is a big question for each one of us. Sometimes we feel like our prayers are not answered. And then we start to question even the existence of God. But our prayers are misguided. Sometimes we ask amiss. And I, I've said it before that sometimes we treat God like a genie. And we say, give me this, give me that, give me, give me, give me. But we're not even, we're not even focused on our salvation. Right? Are we seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? That he will grant. You know, if there are things that are pertaining to salvation, he will, it's very clear. Scripture is very clear about that. But when we ask for a good grade on the test, 
if we ask for a certain job, if we ask for a car, if we ask for the house, we may or may not get it, right? Because it may or may not be aligned to the salvation, to his will. And, and we, have to be, we have to be conscious of that, right? We, we, we have to be careful not to ask amiss because he knows our true intention. He knows the inner man if we want to spend it on our pleasures, right? Um, I think this is a good place to end for today. Uh, not to go too far in.